afternoon. Let's, we're all going to get settled. Speakers coming on up. Grab a seat. Who do we have? Andrew, scooch, scoot down so you're sitting. You want to sit in order, or you want? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. We're Andrew, Pooja, David, then Eric. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Sprung. I'm a civic engagement manager at Microsoft and very pleased to be moderating this panel this afternoon. Uh, we have an awesome list of speakers who submitted some fantastic abstracts for you this afternoon. Uh, I'll, I'll start by introducing everyone. Uh, Andrew Cedar from Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. We have Pooja Chandra Shaker, how to do, uh, from Harvard. Uh, David Delmar from Resilient Coders, and Eric Gordon from the Engagement Lab at Emerson. So each presenter, as you've probably been experiencing all today, is going to have about uh, 10 minutes to talk through new models of cross-sector collaboration, enhancing data use in communities. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about how we can, how community organizations uh, can leverage data better, are leveraging data currently, and then we'll leave some time for questions from the audience. So thanks, Andrew. I'll let you get started. The here. clicker, if you'd like to, totally what's, oops. Uh, I wouldn't mind sitting if the mic can go on. There we go. Great. Clicker? Yep, hold, there's something funky. This Microsoft software, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally my fault. Everyone, bring it on. Good. It's not, try to Seems click. Up there. I know, it looks fine. Um. Do we have some technical support that's telling me? Yeah, maybe go ahead and start, but we will, we, it looks like we need to reboot. Oh wait, it went away. You're good. Oh. Okay. Whoa, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Cedar, and along with Christopher Scranton, who's seated over here, um, here to present about the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative and Job Case Partnership. Uh, together, we built a pilot online local jobs portal uh, that's scalable and replicable to other places. Uh, the work stems originally from a pitch at the 2016 National Day of Civic Hacking at Code for Boston. Uh, at the time, the problem statement was in the familiar format, how might we use technology to make it easier for young people in Boston to find local jobs? Beneath this problem statement, you'll find a structural inequity that privileges public transit investment for the benefit of residents of wealthy white neighborhoods and their jobs in the downtown core. Uh, simply put, the city's public transit infrastructure, the region's infrastructure, does not prioritize the needs of young people from Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. Uh, getting around the city uh, and the region is hard enough, and what's more, uh, the algorithms used for searching for local jobs exacerbate this inequity. I'll say it again. The algorithms used for searching for local jobs exacerbate this underlying inequity. Case in point. Um, we've talked a lot about transit today. Um, at the time of the National Day of Civic Hacking, most online job aggregators had a minimum search radius of five miles, as, as the crow flies, as they say. Um, so if a young person living near Dennis Street Park in Roxbury searched for a job, they would get, in theory, results uh, as far north uh, as Everett, as far south as Milton. Uh, but if you went to one of those job aggregator sites and searched for jobs near Boston, do you think that the search radius uh, would be centered in Roxbury, the true geographical center of Boston? No. Uh, it's going to center that uh, search radius around the center of the Shalmet Peninsula, likely at City Hall, which would in turn extend a job search north into Revere. That's why I've got these two different disks here, uh, sort of in Euclidean space, five miles from the center of Shalmet, five miles right at Dennis Street Park. Um, and as we all know, as researchers and, um, and data, data nerds, uh, five miles as the crow flies does not translate into five miles traveling on public transit. Uh, I did a quick back of the envelope calculation and a young person leaving from Dennis Street Park going to a job in, say, the Wonderland Marketplace uh, in, in Revere would actually have to travel 10 miles on public transit, one hour each way, minimum, not including waiting for the bus, waiting for the train, delays, any of that. 
Uh, I don't think I need to remind you about how busy our young people are, uh, but it's simply not right to expect a young person to spend eight hours a week minimum getting to a part-time job while they're trying to succeed in school and, you know, uh, be a teenager. Uh, so again, I'll go back to this problem statement, how might we use technology to help our young people find jobs in their neighborhoods? Screenshot for you. Uh, so instead of building an application from scratch, uh, the team from National Day of Civic Hacking approached a company whose focus is matching people to jobs and to each other. Job case. Uh, Christopher is representing them over here again. Um, after introductions, collaboration, iteration, uh, we launched this pilot Dudley neighborhood jobs portal, a uh, place for young people and really anyone to go and find local jobs and employers, give voice to their personal employment experiences, which is key, and those, the challenges there, uh, and to lend support for their neighbors. Um, uh, obviously, this project unfortunately did not solve the underlying structural inequity that sparked the conversation initially, uh, but I think it's a strong foundation to build some solutions on at least. Uh, you can visit the portal right now at jobcase.com slash Dudley. I uh, put it up there. Uh, there's a nice uh, photo, uh, I think Travis Watson took that. Uh, and to just give you a basic sense of what the portal, what the features are on this, um, one, it's the local job search with a novel one mile radius, uh, which was implemented directly as a result of the DSNI job case partnership. Uh, on the left side, under, um, there's actually two sides here. One, community uh, is sort of the group. Uh, the job case group that people can join, and then under that is local jobs. And that's a, a feed of the most recently posted local jobs uh, from local employers. Uh, to the right, kind of hard to see with the screenshots, sorry about that, uh, is a site called Conversations, uh, where you can preview uh, recent comments and requests from local job seekers. Uh, we at DSNI posted a lot um, from opportunities at our own office and our neighborhood partners, um, just sort of offer support, um, like a chat. Uh, also important to note uh, that the platform is uh, independent, has independent functionality, meaning that someone can use it on a smartphone, they can use it on a desktop. Uh, and Christopher asked me to note that um, he went and ground truthed whether this technology works at the Timothy Smith Network's 23 locations in Roxbury. Um, I think that's a really great example of a corporate or industry partner actually going out and trying to build relationships uh, in our communities uh, to see how and why things work. Um, so what do we learn from this collaboration, you're wondering? <clears throat> uh, I would say we successfully found a balance uh, that took into consideration the different starting points of a venture-backed Kendall Square big data tech company and DSNI, a nonprofit. Um, we found alignment on several important areas. Number one, first and foremost, is cultural competency. Um, if you're entering in these, into these kinds of partnerships, I'd argue that cultural competency is as important uh, specifically for technology companies as diversity and inclusion. Uh, if you're a company or a large organization, the representatives you choose to lead engagements with community partners need to have cultural competency in order to build trust and enable your collaboration to succeed. Um, in our partnership, uh, DSNI had some, some tech skills in place, just as job cases, point person, uh, had important experience working in nonprofits and marginalized communities. Number two uh, is pace. What I, yeah, respect the different paces of the work. Um, this was maybe the biggest challenge that we overcame, uh, which was being clear at the outset about what is the pace of the work. Um, uh, believe it or not, uh, big data company moves faster than DSNI. Uh, DSNI is a resident led. Um, uh, rather, DSNI is resident-led, and the community processes that are in place are focused on how to create a space for resident leadership to flourish, specifically. Uh, these community processes are not built with economic efficiency in mind. Um, it's important to understand, though, that waiting in order to respect a community's timeline was not a shortfall during this process. Adjusting the pace was a strength because it demonstrated that the collaboration genuinely valued the community's input. Um, number three, I sort of hinted at this earlier, uh, our partnership is an example of uh, what we might call like creative research and development. Uh, indeed, integrating input, input from a community-based organization as part of the R in R&D uh, led us to one of the collaboration's major technical outputs, the one-mile search. 
Uh, the combination of community input and responsive engineering on job cases side led to the development of better uh, human-centered features that more directly empower users on the platform itself. Um, I would say that's a major value add, and I expect the other companies will be playing catch up. Um, so here I have um, a, a, a bullet point about shared resource organizations, which is sort of a collaborative model that nonprofits can use in order to lower costs. Um, I think a major benefit of community-based organizations using a technology platform like JobCase is that the platform provides an opportunity to completely offload the requirement to have an in-house customer relation management system, a CRM. Um, for DSNI, uh, we use the platform specifically to make sure that young people uh, who were working for our summer employment program were able to create and store resumes. This is something they now have permanently. We don't have to worry about upkeeping it over time in DSNI's own uh, CRM. Um, yeah, again, this is a spin off of the shared resource organization model where cash strapped nonprofits pool their resources and share the costs of, for example, an IT contractor. Uh, I think uh, to the workforce development folk in the room, um, there is real opportunity for workforce development coalitions in particular to use a platform like this to reduce technology costs, increase engagement, expand access to analytics, uh, and, engage, and coordinate larger workforce development strategies. I think that's in the works currently, hopefully. Um, and for those who have experience doing work in communities, uh, what needs to be developed is like an actual referral and reporting process that organizations would get from a platform like this and then ultimately share with each other. Uh, this would require a lot of organizing and coordination on the ground. Uh, the technology platform itself would not just magically work in this way, uh, but rather its value would be measured by how much it's actually used by people on the ground. Um, yeah, you can ask Christopher here for more details, of course, but my understanding is that uh, engaging with a community-based organization surfaced important opportunities for innovation within the technology company. Again, um, this one-mile search is made, that's product development, um, uh, in addition to providing an opportunity for job case employees to fulfill the mission of the organization. All right, uh, didn't have too much time to fill out this next step slide here. Um, but the, with a lot of, lot of open questions right now, I'd say. Um, this was sort of a pilot, a pilot project uh, that we're, we're happy with. Um, yeah, a lot of open questions about how to build the foundation of a neighborhood jobs portal. What does this mean? Um, from DSNI's perspective, we're really interested in how to create ways for young people not just to find any job, but quality jobs. Uh, and encourage employers to create quality jobs uh, for young people. Um, we did some work with uh, Jobs for the Future. Is anyone from JFF here? Out of curiosity, no. Um, to identify best bet job training programs for young people which were transit accessible, they led to a job which paid a livable wage, they didn't require a bachelor's degree, uh, they had a clear pathway for professional development. Um, perhaps, uh, hint, hint, uh, there's a way of using a technology platform like JobCase to boost awareness about these kinds of quality job opportunities for our neighborhood's young people. Um, I mentioned the local jobs referral network earlier. Um, I think there's great opportunity there. Um, and ideally, you know, employers and both young people have a single place they can go to to try to, um, to, try to find uh, uh, good work. And yeah, more to come. That's all I have. Can everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pooja Chandrasekhar, um, and myself, along with Alicia Akani, who's sitting over there, um, are the founders of the Action and Civic Tech, or ACT, Scholars Program. Um, so I'll be talking a bit about, um, can I bend this back a little bit? The advantages of having a Microsoft. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, what the program is, what really motivated us to start this program, um, a little bit about the early impacts of our program, and then what the next steps are moving forward. So the ACT Scholars Program really stemmed from uh, myself and Alicia's recognition that um, 
there's this huge demographic that's very underrepresented in both technology and in politics slash government. Um, and that demographic is low income and minority young people. Uh, so this demographic is very often excluded from conversations about technology, often excluded about conversations about uh, new government policies, new civic policies, um, conversations about how to improve the city and the urban environment. Um, and so we really saw, saw this gap in both of these fields and wondered how can we br bridge this gap and how can we um, use a lot of the new conversations that's been happening about civic tech to help bridge this gap. Um, so both of us have a little bit of a background in civic tech, Alicia much more than myself. Um, and to tell you a little bit about ourselves uh, first to orient you, so we're both students at Harvard College. Um, I'm a current undergrad senior uh, studying biomedical engineering and Alicia is a current undergrad sophomore studying computer science. Um, and so both of us had a background in starting tech programs and diversity in tech programs um, and we're really passionate about how to use technology to solve civic problems. Um, and how do you specifically look at this, um, this problem of exclusion of, these, of this community and how do you bridge this gap? Um, so our objective, very simply stated, is to teach civic tech and data science at under-resourced high schools. Um, so specifically, want, we want to bring conversations about data science um, to addressing civic problems and specifically to help uh, low-income and minority youth in Boston recognize the potential and power of civic tech to really address these problems. Um, and so what the Scholars Program, the ACT Scholars Program is, um, and I'll walk you through exactly why um, it's structured this way. So it's a weekly semester-long class that's run at Excel High School in Dorchester. Um, so Excel High School is a traditionally under-resourced high school in South Boston, um, pretty lacking in terms of financial support, um, but also very motivated to help its young students really reach their full potential. So that's kind of the, the sweet spot of why we chose Excel. Um, you know, the school staff and administrators were really looking for programs, um, and I believe they've done some other work with Harvard before. Um, how can they really bring after school programs? How can they bring in school programs that really enrich the, the curriculum offerings at the school? And so um, that was a great choice for our first pilot program. Um, and then as for who actually teaches the programs, these sessions are taught by data scientists from around Boston. Um, and they're taught how to use data from the city of Boston, so specifically data.boston.gov, to address a very wide-ranging set of issues. So everything from public health, and food inspections, to environmental issues, and the public school system. So that's really set up to cater to the wide range of interests that students have. Um, we recognize that you know, not all students are interested in public health, not all are interested in environmental science, so how can we really design a program that best meets and um, piques their interest? And uh, it's structured as six weeks of instruction, four weeks of independent project work. I'll get to what the independent project work entails. Um, and I think the biggest and most key component of our program, and especially why it's relevant to this session, um, are our partners. So we work directly with the Boston Mayor's Office and the City of Boston um, Citywide Analytics Team, as well as Excel High School. And then we, of course, are a community organization. Um, and as for why we structured this as a class instead of an after-school program um, or a program on the weekends, is because we were told, um, so we originally wanted to run this as a Saturday or a Sunday program, um, as a lot of other diversity in tech or um, civic programs are structured as. So, but what the school staff told us repeatedly was that, um, you know, a lot of these students, given their socioeconomic background, are working on the weekends. Um, they're working after school, they're working at really any chance they can get to support their families, and it's really important to meet them where they are. Um, and they actually get cr school credit for taking part in our class. Um, and it fulfills, I think, their art and culture and technology requirement. So that's, you know, that's a really at the heart of our program. So why open data? So I'm sure you're all familiar with this question, but I'll just highlight some key points. Um, first, it's accessible. It's not something that, you know, requires crossing some financial barrier to obtain and access, um, and I think you know, that's again at the heart of our mission. We want this to be as accessible um, to all students as we possibly can reach. Uh, second, updated regularly. So, you know, it's not some static uh, data set that's online. It's constantly changing, constantly updating. 
Third, improve citywide transparency. So, you know, by educating young people on how can they harness this data that's available to them, we are contributing to the city's mission of increasing transparency around um, civic issues. Um, fourth, we can source ideas from a citizen's lens. Again, getting at this issue that I talked about that young people are often left out of these conversations and by, doing, by using open data, we can really harness what their ideas are for improving the city. Um, and lastly, improves the cycle of innovation, again, by bringing in a group that's not already part of this cycle and really making use of their potential. Um, so now I'd like to highlight the school city nonprofit partnership or um, cycle that I talked about briefly before because I think it's very relevant to us here. Uh, there's something about working, bringing in all three of these community partners together and being able to uh, tap into the collective resources of this network. Um, for example, the city can provide data, the city can provide insights from a citywide level on what matters to the city, um, and you can't get that from a school or a community organization. Now the school can provide access to it first its students and also um, on the, the state of the students and what matters to the students and you can't get that from a city or just us as an outside organization. Um, and lastly, we as a community organization can provide both the school and city with support and access to resources that they might not otherwise have, specifically through our programs and through our instruction. And by bringing in, as a community organization, we can also work with all of these outside um, teachers who are you know, data scientists to bring them in and help them contribute to the whole mentorship um, and you know, bring, helping bring these students' tech and civic skills up to speed. Um, so now I'm just going to walk you through two example session topics that we taught this um, past semester. So our program, uh, I, think, I don't know if I mentioned this, but it started in uh, early February and it's going to go through late May. So uh, we just finished up our weeks of instruction and we're transitioning to our final projects now. So example session topics, two of which, both of which we taught this semester. The first was food inspection data. So uh, the city has a lot of data available about food inspections. And the question that we asked um, students to explore and which the instructor challenged the students to uh, learn about and answer for themselves is which food establishments have failed the most inspections in the past year. Um, and then the second is looking at city service data, so everything about utilities or uh, potholes or lights that are broken. Uh, the data, the city has a lot of data about um, where these issues are, whether or not they were addressed, when were they addressed, who were they addressed by. Um, so, you know, these are problems and issues that this, these students experience on a daily basis. They're annoyed by them, they're irritated, their families are irritated by them. So it's something that has a lot of relevance to them and they can uh, empathize with that. Uh, so we looked at the question, which Boston neighborhoods have the most reported but unaddressed city service issues? Um, so a really interesting question for the students to think about. Um, and I just wanted to touch on these to give you a sense of how do we kind of structure the session to not just give them this, this data set and have them kind of like go off on a tangent with it, but also to help them brainstorm what question to answer. So we usually don't give them these questions ahead of time. We help them work to that question. And I think there's a lot to say about that process of brainstorming um, as well, which will undoubtedly help them in the future. So I said we're transitioning to our final projects now. So I have a couple up here. Um, and so we're gonna actually give the students some time to pick these projects either in the course of the coming week, um, whatever really piques their interest the most, um, and they're gonna work in groups on these. So for example, these were directly provided by Boston Citywide Analytics team, by the way. Um, so really, again, getting at that idea of what matters to the city uh, and how, how can the students work actually contribute to improving the city's mission. So how does the city use energy? Um, how can you look at commuting in Boston? And how can you look at Boston Public Schools um, it, in terms of school improvements? So you can get an idea again of um, how do we structure these final projects to really, uh, to really go kind of serve as a wraparound for the students' interests as well as the city's interests. So lastly, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about what have we learned from our time running the program. Um, again, we're in the middle of our program right now, so we haven't finished the final project component, so I'm not gonna touch so much on the 
final project component and mostly focus on the instruction piece. Um, so I think our biggest takeaway in a sentence is that consistency and engagement are key. Um, are key to not only this program and how it's structured, but also the demographic we're targeting, um, the ideas we are teaching these students, and the skills we're equipping them with. Um, so first, the students came in with a very wide background of um, how much they'd been exposed to technology, how much they'd been exposed to programming and data science. Um, you know, some of them had written some uh, some code before in their in their school CS classes. Some of them hardly knew what code was. So I think for us, one of the biggest learning points um, as we move forward is uh, really putting in time, budgeting time and resources at the beginning of our pr program to uh, bring everyone up to the same level. Um, and I think we tried to do that as we went from week to week, but I think if we had known that before, we would have brought, put in time, um, uh, specific time at the beginning to allow for that. Uh, the second is engagement of students is really critical. So there is a range of students in terms of what they're interested in. Some are more interested in the engineering and technology side of things. Some are more interested in the civic side of things. Um, so I think making sure one of one specific um, uh, specific learning point is making sure that we make the the civic piece of each class very very upfront at the beginning of the class. So for example, many of the students were interested, you know, in the, in the food inspection bit and how, how are food inspections conducted? Why are they conducted? Um, how does the city benefit or lose from them? And I think instead of putting that as a, um, kind of doing that at the end of the class or doing it kind of woven through the class, making sure that the civic piece is forefront um, is at the forefront of how we're teaching these classes and how they're thinking about um, each session is really critical to driving student engagement because at that point in their careers, in their academic lives, you know, they're really interested in the questions. Um, and so making sure that we're treating the questions as important as the data is essentially what I'm trying to say. Um, and additionally, consistency in terms of week to week. So how we structured it, each data scientist can teach their own session, essentially. And we told them that uh, we'd help structure, we'd help them uh, think through their curriculum to make sure it builds on the previous instructor's curriculum. Um, and so it's a great way to encourage independence and creativity for each um, instructor. But I think uh, for next year, what we, we were just talking about before this talk is um, we are going to come up with a kind of bare bones curriculum on which topic to teach when and then ask the instructors to provide their own input and feedback on that. Because um, I think having, having us think through this longitudinal curriculum is really important for ensuring that there's consistency from session to session because um, that was sometimes lost when each instructor brought their own teaching style and their own interest to each um, to each week. Um, so I think that's all I have, uh, but I'll leave time for questions after our panel, and please feel free to um, reach out to any of us. In terms of next steps, what we're hoping to do is expand the program next year uh, beyond just one pilot, so if you're interested in helping us bring this to other schools, bring this to other communities, uh, please do reach out to us. We'd love to work with you and hear from you. Thank you. Uh, wow, this is impressive. There's a lot of cool stuff being done. Um, my name is David Delmar. I'm the founder of an organization called Resilient Coders. Uh, we're a nonprofit coding boot camp. Most of us are familiar with sort of the, the coding boot camp craze. Uh, so unfortunately, not everyone can shell out the 18 grand to attend a coding boot camp. Um, and so we work explicitly with uh, communities of color uh, and low income in Boston. And we, we bring them on this sort of uh, super intensive 14-week uh, program. And then at the end of it, connect them with employment opportunities. Um, so this is, this is Dunya. She's one of our sort of earlier uh, alumni. And she's now a, a full-time engineer. Uh, and she's a huge presence in our alumni community. Um, we, look, we, uh, people tend to assume that we do this work because we, we love, I'm going to raise this up a little bit. There we go. Um, so people tend to assume that we do this because we, we love coding, we're passionate about computer science. That is not the case. <laughs> um, we do this because that's where the jobs are. 
Uh, we, we communicate to our employers and to our students, look, if tomorrow what's big in Boston is like prosthetics manufacturing, guess what? We're gonna be resilient prosthetic manufacturers, <laughs> right? So we're doing this 100% for the jobs because that's where the jobs are at right here in Boston. And I know this is kind of sometimes hard to communicate here in the land of the famous 3.3% unemployment rate. But in Dorchester, right, if you account for actually what is the real unemployment rate, including people who have stopped looking for work, uh, that number is at 27.8%. And that's, that's right now, right? Let's take a minute to talk about the future of work, right? Because Future of work is a big buzz, buzz topic in the, uh, in the tech community. Um, now, you may or may not know that the most common job among American men of color is driver. And among women, it's retail associate. So what happens when those jobs disappear? What happens then? What happens to our city? Right? So we know that the jobs don't disappear, right? Most of us, like the, sort of like the data people, and the, actually the jobs don't disappear. They change, right? They change. And along with that change comes some level of training, right? And we're in a situation right now where the jobs have changed, but we're not doing the training necessary to make access to these jobs equitable. I believe every generation hears a call, right? And I think that the call that we are hearing now is for equity and access to these jobs. Equity and access to the jobs that are going to survive this next wave of automation. That is why we do what we do at Resilient Coders. And so we partner uh, with a lot of employer partners and, a, and with a lot of sort of sourcing organizations that, that send us potential students to go through this intensive program. Um, and we spend a lot of time with our, with our employer partners talking about what are we talking about when we say equity? Because our, our, our employer partners often have different notions of what we're talking about. So I have put together for all of you a comprehensive list of what is and what is not equity. These are the conversations that we have with a lot of our employer partners. What we're not interested in your meetup, in your discussion, in your, in your blog posts, in your tweets. We want jobs, right? We have a lot of uncomfortable conversations with employers where they say, we're gonna send you some people to volunteer. Great, hire our students. Um, and again, the reason we do this is not just to give people access to, uh, to the education. Computer science is fantastic. Um, we do this because of the jobs. And so if people aren't hiring our students, it's imperative that I invest the time to find out why. And I understand whether there are sort of risk factors that our employers are seeing, right, and mitigate those risk factors. So one of the things that we're starting to do now is we're experimenting with a new model um, that people aren't quite really doing yet for the most part. Uh, wow, this did not really uh, survive the transition well to a slide. So I'm a, I'm a designer, and I love making very small, classy, and completely illegible text. So I'll just tell you what's on here. And you can use your imagination and pretend that you can read it. Um, so, we, so the boot camp is 14 weeks long. Um, it is very intensive, and it is infused with what our employers are looking for. So we basically just went to our employers and said, just give us the job description. What, like, what are you trying to hire for? And we kind of find the center of the Venn diagram of the technical aptitudes, and we teach to that. Uh, and then after that, they go through the 14 weeks, and we involve our employers as, as volunteers, as mentors. And by the way, this is why we, we don't really do a lot of recruitment of mentors, because we do our recruitment of mentors from among the employers. Because, by the way, there's no better way to find someone who's going to be a good asset to your team than to sit with them elbow to elbow when they're working their way through a problem, and you get to see how it is that they think, and you get to be a part of that and get inside their heads and think, all right, well, if this is how they're going to think about you know, JavaScript or whatever, how are they going to sort of translate that over to, um, to another core skill at the company? Um, and so after, after they learn those skills, they do an apprenticeship, usually. And I'll come back to why I'm saying usually here. Um, but they do an apprenticeship, and it goes for about a four to six months. Um, and we do this in partnership with the employer. Uh, we have a shared understanding of what success looks like. We try to be as clear and as explicit as we possibly can. At the end of six months, this person will have been successful if blank. If they will have created an application from scratch, if they can lead a presentation on object-oriented programming, 
uh, if what? Because then we, the staff, can team up with that individual and with that employer to make sure that we are staying along what we call the path. And the path is just our way of acknowledging the fact that we keep learning on the job, right, during that first job. And so we say to our employers, we're gonna be on top of you, we're gonna call you, we literally communicate with our managers every week to ask them how this individual is doing. Um, because we wanna make sure that we understand and we can be an ally and make sure that that person is successful. So that at the end of that, that apprenticeship, they can convert to a full-time job. Now, the reason I said usually earlier is because uh, we're at kind of a, an interesting phase right now where some of our employers are just completely leapfrogging this and just hiring people full-time, um, which, which is a great conversation to have with the, org the companies that have been sort of leapfrogged. Um, but we, of course, want to provide on, for, on, you know, on roads for the other students to, uh, to do this apprenticeship right in the full-time hire. Um, and so we are in what I like to call the relentless pursuit of better. Can you read this one? All right, cool, you can read this one, kind of. Um, so I like to do what I call the tour of why not. So the tour of why not is kind of what it sounds like. I just go and I speak to employers, especially employers that have expressed interest in hiring out of Brazilian coders, but didn't quite. And I ask, why not? So based on that conversation, we influence our curriculum. By the way, every boot camp that we run is different from the one before um, because we believe in just existing in a constant state of self-disruption. So we, we come from sort of the tech startup world where the way you build product is with sort of a series of failures, right? You build, you measure, and you pivot. You build and you measure and you pivot. So that's how we run a program. Um, so a big part of the build, measure, pivot loop is understanding why not. Now, when I've gone into these conversations, it calls to mind uh, a, uh, a speech that I heard. I had the privilege of hearing Ta-Nehisi Coates speak. Um, actually, I heard Ta-Nehisi Coates speak the day after the election. Um, and one of the things that he said was, you know, for every foot that some people in this country have to jump, other people have to jump six feet. And I kind of brought that with me into these conversations of why not with our employers. Uh, because it has happened often that our employers say, well, you know, we didn't quite hire out of your program because we need individuals to, uh, to have skills with uh, React, with Node, with, with Mongo. Now, these are, these, if you guys are not technical, these are sort of like the languages du jour right now. They're just like the hot programming languages. No one is teaching them in colleges. Um, the expectation is that you just sort of like learn this. You teach, it, you teach yourself, right? Or you might learn on the job. Um, but no one in college is teaching this. And so these companies, they have campus recruitment agencies, right, that are hiring other individuals who do not know React, Node, and Mongo. And yet we are being asked to, to put out their talent that knows all these technical skills. And again, I keep going back to this five-foot gap that was addressed by Ta-Nehisi Coates. So <clears throat> we made the uncomfortable decision um, of just doing it all, right? We say to our students, we might not be able to do anything about this five-foot gap, but we can build a springboard, right? And so now we have completely changed the model and we have invested in teaching all of those things that are actually beyond what you might learn in college. Right? We skip over the, the sort of computer science theory uh, and algorith al algorithmic thinking that is very sort of important to computer science broadly, but we go right to programming and we go right for the languages that our employers are hiring for. React, Node, Mongo, and we go full on in JavaScript just so that we can make sure that we are matching the job descriptions that are out there and then connecting our, individual with those op our individuals with those opportunities. Um, so now on the other side, we're also um, becoming a little bit smarter with the way that we put our talent out there. So one of the things that we've done is that we have a roster. So you can go on our website and you can navigate to or you can just go to, can you read this one? No, all right. <laughs> You can go to our website, resilientcoders.org, and you can navigate to a roster of, uh, of people, and you can see their, their blurbs, how they talk about themselves, their resumes. You can see the work that they've done. By the time someone finishes our program, they will have built at least one full stack application, um, which again, for the non-technical people, is cool. Just take my word for it, that's like impressive. Um, and uh, so they, they do all of this, and they also put it all up to GitHub, so it's all, it's all up there. You can see like 20-ish projects that uh, someone will work on during the course of these 14 weeks. Um, and they are all theirs, 
right? This is not like us handing somebody a template and asking someone to kind of dust it off. These are projects that they have come up with, often based on uh, past lived experiences, right? So this last boot camp, we had actually not one but two individuals um, create a program that helps connect uh, homeless individuals with housing uh, because both of them have struggled with housing insecurities. Um, and, uh, and they present those to a room full of employers. We actually had one, one of my favorite final projects that we had was a musician um, who was trying to find a way to be paid as a musician. Uh, and so he created a, a, a streaming service, sort of like a Spotify or Pandora, um, that while you listen to it, mines your computer for Bitcoin. <laughs> yep. And then hypothetically, pays the musician out of that Bitcoin. Um, so these are the sorts of things that we're seeing um, coming out of this, out of this boot camp. Um, and so now we have all these tools that we, we put them in front of our employers and say, all right, here are the individuals you used to hire, a one, two, three, you talk to this person, that person, the other person, here's everything about that person that you can find. And uh, mercifully, we're at a point now where we finally have more interest in our students than we have students. Uh, for this last boot camp that just graduated two weeks ago, um, we had 13 students graduate, uh, and we had uh, 41 employers um, express enough interest to start that, the, uh, the, the uh, interviewing process. We had almost 100 people show up at our demo day. Uh, so little by little, <laughs> we're getting there and pulling together all these disparate pieces, right? The employers, educational opportunities, other nonprofits, and we are creating some sort of a framework whereby those, in, well, those um, organizations can collaborate to get people connected to jobs. I don't know how much time I have left, but I think that's all I need. Thank you. Um, that was great. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks a lot for all these talks. Um, so my name is Eric Gordon. I'm a, I'm a professor at Emerson College, and I, I direct a lab there called the Engagement Lab, where we're kind of an R&D unit for uh, technology and civic engagement. And we're looking at some of these intersections and exploring opportunities um, that, that exist for, uh, for interesting uh, design experiments and the way that, that public institutions actually open up and interface. Um, so what I want to talk to you today about is, is actually a research project that we just did that, that, um, that looked at um, community organizations primarily. We wanted to understand precisely how uh, organizations are using technology and media um, to solve problems. And, and what we were really interested in is how they were uh, actually thinking about how to evaluate that work, or put another way, what ways um, they can articulate the value of the work that they're doing. Because one of the challenges is with the whole space of civic tech, often, uh, is that there's, there, there is not great language around um, what impact looks like. Uh, and, and, so, and, and so we tend to fall into um, bad habits like counting things and, um, and, and just counting whatever is countable. And so what, what we did was we, we, wanted to, we wanted to look at, we wanted to explore that further and to try to understand where, um, where the, some of this value might be. I'm gonna put this in a little bit of context, and I have 10 minutes, right? Amy, can you give me some signals when? Okay, great. Um, so I wanna put this in some sort of context, uh, which, is, which is really this, this context of trust. And this is, this is no mystery, but, but trust in government is, is, uh, is way down. Uh, this is from 2015, so it's a bit old, but um, this, and this, uh, this Pew study looks at the trust in federal government uh, in the United States, and, and it shows some, some interesting uh, downward, downward spirals, and those numbers for uh, local government are a little bit better, but they're still, um, they're, they're still heading downward. Um, and government isn't alone. Trust in institutions in general uh, is, is, uh, uh, seems to be in a bit of crisis. So that individuals don't necessarily, it's not that they just don't trust government, they don't trust the media, and this is global, not just, uh, not just in the United States. They don't trust the media, they don't trust uh, churches, civic organizations. Um, institutions in general are, are um, put into, um, you know, are, are a bit suspect. And so that's the context that I think I, I, that, that I want to approach this, um, this next uh, seven or eight minutes I have with you, is to understand that as organizations are 
um, deploying and inventing and adapting technologies, um, what's happening is they're also trying to respond to a context of, of distrust. And sometimes technology is, is, uh, is employed as a means of addressing that problem. So I'll give you an example in Boston that, that many of you are probably familiar with, which is the recent example with the Boston Public Schools um, and, uh, and the, the, the shifting of start times uh, in, the, in the city. Um, and there was, this was a technological solution that was incredibly smart. Uh, and uh, that, that incredibly smart technological solution that determined new start times in the city was met with a whole lot of anger. Uh, and, so, and what's interesting about this is that, is that uh, uh, parents and families and, and, uh, and, and school employees gathered in, uh, at, at the BPS headquarters uh, to protest these, these changes. What was really being protested was the fact that no one really consulted them, or at least they felt that they were not being consulted. And these changes were made because of a smart algorithm, but they weren't made uh, in any kind of uh, collaboration or, or conversation um, with, with the people that it impacted. And so the, the idea and what, we, and what we call civic media in, in our lab, and, and others use this phrase as well, and, and I, I can talk later about why we've sort of moved away from civic tech if anybody's interested, but it's media and technology that facilitates democratic process. So it's not just technology and service that's solving problems, but it's the way in which people are actually thinking about, about technology to build trust um, and, and do that through the, through the facilitation of democratic process. And so the, what I'm going to tell you about is a, is a qualitative study we did with uh, media, uh, media practitioners, and I use that very broadly because we talked to mostly uh, community organizations who were using media and technology, um, uh, people within um, people within sort of uh, uh, public public sector adjacent organizations that were again deploying media and technology. Those are the people that we sampled, um, and and we looked in in three cities: in Boston, Chicago, and and Oakland. And so what I'm going to talk to you about, going to merge these are the themes that we pulled out of these interviews. Um, that that is. Um, that hopefully will make sense in a second. Um, let me tell you that the, the primary value that we were able to, to, to pull out is something that, that I've been kicking around for, for a while, um, but it's this idea that what really what was happening is that people were interested in the concept of creating uh, what, what we call meaningful inefficiencies. And so what, what that means is that um, in, 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 in opposition almost to the kinds of efficiency model that, that uh, people uh, use when they think about technology, what was happening with a lot of these organizations was that they were interested in using technology, but to do so in such a way that opened up space, uh, created actually uh, inefficiencies within that space um, so that this, this kind of democratic process and trust could actually um, unfold. And, and I won't go into too much into where this uh, to where this idea came from, but it really is inspired by um, inspired by the by the process of games, uh, game design, where games are by definition inefficient systems, and in that they are uh, they are systems that we that we enter into with uh, unnecessary obstacles, and we try to achieve our goals, and we agree to those rules uh, in order to play the game. And so really what was happening, what we saw happening within these civic organizations was that they were actually designing in that way for, for a process, for an experience that was meaningfully inefficient. So let me say a little bit about what this looks like. So what we were able to do is kind of map a, 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 a horizontal and a vertical here that I'll explain in a second. Um, what we see is, as civic media practice, this is what we're calling civic media practice, is can, be, um, can be mapped onto two axes. Um, the, the, the horizontal is social infrastructure that goes from weak to strong. So to what extent when people are using technology to solve problems, um, to what extent are they doing so with a weak social infrastructure? So how well do they know the communities that they're operating in? Um, and that, that moves from weak to strong. And then the novel to the, to the longitudinal. And in that sense, the, the objective of the project itself. So, um, so to what extent are people using novelty as a way of bringing a, using attention uh, to get people into a certain thing? And to what extent is that novelty being pushed into some sort of uh, longitudinal practice? So the, um, the act of, of, of uh, sort of engaging in this practice, we, we, we see into, into four distinct activities. And I'll explain them each very briefly. Um, network building, holding space for discussion, distributing ownership, and persistent input. So let me describe what we saw people actually doing uh, as they were uh, deploying, inventing, and adapting technologies. 
network building, and this was mentioned by several people on the panel, that, that, that uh, the goal of a lot of this work is to actually build network, it is building networks, which is the act of convening either in person or online for the purpose of social connectivity. It seems really mundane, but it's actually uh, interesting is that when people talk about the, the, the work that they're doing with technology, it's this, this is the value that they consistently point to is the way in which that technology is bringing people, um, bringing people from diverse backgrounds together. Holding space for discussion um, is similar to network building, but in this case we define it as ass assuring that there is time and space for discussion that makes room for multiple viewpoints and is tolerant of dissent. Um, in this case, it's about, again, taking that opportunity uh, to adapt some, uh, what may be a, uh, an inefficient process to assure that the, that the appropriate people are in the room and then that room is appropriately tolerant of dissent. Um, that's a lot of work. Um, and what's interesting is that we don't often associate that work with technology, um, but it's the work that people were doing um, with, the, with, their, with their projects. Distributing ownership is something that was a value that seemed to be um, um, pretty well adopted. It's the idea that the designer or convener takes time to build capacity of all stakeholders to reproduce or modify designed activities. So in this case, this is the way in which people were, um, were engaging in these projects in such a way where the use of the, product, the, the project or product would leave people with some kind of capacity to continue that work beyond when the designer or the convener leaves. Again, it seems like a simple idea, but often the civic tech dialogues that we have is about a, a kind of swoop in, swoop out problem solving um, situation and not necessarily about the building capacity. Uh, and that's the kind of work that we really um, seek to highlight. And then finally, persistent input, which is probably the most difficult of the, of the four activities. Um, which is the idea that, that inputs into products or process from stakeholders continue beyond initial release or implementation. And this is a problem because it's tied to funding cycles or project cycles, um, and there's often not an, a, a capacity uh, to do this work. I have one minute left. Um, so, and that is yellow. So, um, <laughs> so, so let me, uh, I, could, I could tell you that, that what, what we're doing with this is that, so we, this was a report that was uh, funded by the MacArthur Foundation. We're actually now building out the instrumentation so that, um, so that organizations who are doing this work are able to articulate the value of their work um, in a way that actually looks at these activities and in a way that can get close um, to be able, be, being able to plot over time one's activities on that chart. And so what we're not doing is we're not saying you have to wind up in the top right-hand corner but what you are doing is to say that when you're engaging in civic media practice, you are going to over time, um, you're going to over time be able to plot a positive slope. It's going to move in that direction. So novelty is not a bad thing, but novelty that stays down in the left bottom left hand uh, quadrant perhaps is. And so that's the that's the the, the kind of evaluation structure that we're um, that we're attempting to build. And I am out of time. I want to point uh, your attention to. Uh, just briefly, another, another report that we just published called Community Academic Research Partnerships in Digital Contexts, uh, where this was done with, a, a, with a community organizations all throughout Boston, where we interviewed them around specifically the process of, of collaborating with academic researchers. Um, and we developed an MOU template that, that, um, that hopefully can be widely adopted. We just published this um, actually yesterday. So, um, and then finally, if you're interested in the two reports I mentioned, the first one um, is uh, can be available there in that terribly, um, the, you know, the URL that you can't read. Uh, but, and then the, the, the second one is, uh, is, is where it says MOU. So I appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we have, we have about 10 minutes, I think, um, for some questions. Um, I'll, I'll take the first one that I wanted to direct, and I think at, at Eric, and this came up on our prep call, was something around what's the responsibility of the research community to really help organizations in using data? Softball related to the MOE, the, the document, that, the report that you just mentioned, but um, maybe you can comment on that. No. <laughs> it, well, ironically, that was the question that we yeah. came up with, and you weren't the, even, so, without you there. there. Right, right. <laughs> So what, what's the responsibility of, yeah. of 
Yeah, so I mean, I think it's a it's it's an interesting question. I mean, one of the one of the problems is that um, it's hard to say what the responsibility is of academic researchers when academic institutions don't necessarily hold those values. So one of the challenges is that um, you know that the incentive system for for um, for academic researchers is not to do the kind of work that I'm describing is not to create relationships that are that are persistent and longitudinal. Um, and so, you know, we as academics, we get nothing for that in terms of our career advancement. And so, one of the one of the challenge, the bigger challenge is that we have to actually shift some of the values of the of the academic institutions, the way that IRBs work. Um, these are these are significant problems. Um, I think on a on a smaller level, there are there's a, a a number of scholars who are obviously a lot of people at this event are invested uh, in changing practice. Um, and so, uh, so the, the, the report that we published with the MOU was, was really focused on an MOU that would not replace an IRB, because that's impossible, um, but, but an MOU that would, that would kind of establish a sort of um, a, a set of, of value priorities for both, the, um, for both the academic to say, the academic and the community partner, to say, this is what we want out of this situation, and be honest, you know, yeah, we want out of this we, I need to have a publication to come out of this. And for the community partner to say, yeah, I wouldn't mind having my name on a publication either, or um, that's great, but what we really need is capacity building in the community. So being able to, um, to articulate that prior to the, in, in, the engagement in the research is what we try to do with the, with the MOU. But I think it's an incredibly complicated problem, and I think that the will is there among a lot of, uh, a lot of especially young researchers. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that, that we, we have to sort of slowly push against the, the value system of the institutions that we're working in. Yeah. Andrew, did you have other, I think you had teed up some of that question, so. Sure. Um, I agree um, with your remarks. I also want to emphasize the need for um, maybe a community IRB alternative, uh, which has the community's interests uh, uh, as the, the first priority. Um, Something that, uh, as far as the academic research side is concerned, that DSNI has been developing um, is uh, training uh, residents in participatory action research skills um, for neighborhood surveys, for focus groups, um, so that they can conduct rigorous social science in the neighborhoods uh, in a way that it just stops this gravy train of graduate student interns coming in and then disappearing a week later. Um, but specifically to, to think of that not only for the, you know, the edification of uh, residence education, but also in terms of uh, skill building uh, and workforce development in terms of the social science needs that hospitals and universities have in terms of like uh, determination of needs assessments um, or major surveys so that instead of having to feel the labor to do that from within universities and hospitals, there are residents in neighborhoods who can do that work for them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we will open it up to the audience for questions. Are there questions from? Wow. Oh, good. Yes. Really amazing presentations. Thank you. Uh, so I was uh, on the panel in the morning, and we were like the big data projects uh, panel. If you guys were here at that time. And I have a question for all of you about ways in which we could uh, help you and you could help us. So making more concrete the last part of the discussion, I'm thinking about hiring the people that you train, uh, but also whether we could be instructors in your program or uh, we could you know, be part of the boot camp. Different ways in which we concretely um, be able to partner with you. And I think that for the next conference, a really good thing would be to have the people like me on the first panel and people like you on the same panel and discussing ways in which we can help each other. Uh, I'll jump in on that. Uh, yeah, there are like 42 million ways that we can partner up. Um, so, uh, so, so first and foremost, we, we just, as individuals, as professionals, we just consume a lot of this research. Um, our chief of staff, Rui in the back, and I have like a kind of like a research book club of two. Um, and so the, this stuff really informs um, what we do and, and how we tackle different uh, problems. Um, now, we've also, st we've also done some of this stuff. We actually, we were hired by, um, by a cultural anthropologist at NYU uh, to build one such tool. 
uh, and I will tell you, you guys should check it out. This cultural anthrop anthropologist from NYU got his hands on a really interesting data set, which was life insurance policies that were taken out on slaves in the antebellum South mm. um, by companies that still exist. Mm. Um, and so this professor kind of came to us and said, what can you do with this? And we hired uh, our own alumni um, in a squad that we call Resilient Lab. Resilient Lab is an agency that we run that employs some of our alumni. Um, and we gave them this task to work on. And they built, they built a heat map um, in which you can just see where these policies were taken out on highly skilled slaves um, and uh, down, right down to the name of the individual. Um, and of course the policy holder and like the company, you can see like, you know, John from Savannah, Georgia was a cook and uh, his life insurance policy was underwritten, or was, you know, was through uh, AIG, right? Mm. Um, now, our students are prepared to go out there and work a tech job for the sake of starting their, their careers, but what they really want to be doing is contributing to discussions like this, right? They want to be at this table, right? They want to be part of moving the ball forward in uh, surfacing some of these massive social issues. Um, and so when, when we come back to our alumni and say, hey, what if we work on this project where we can surface some of this research that's being done, uh, they, they love that. I would love to do that. So I'll jump in on that as well, um, especially what you just mentioned about, you know, these students really want to be at this table and really using tech just not for the sake of tech but for actually uh, solving real social issues. So for our students, you know, younger uh, age, but specific ways to partner with organizations and programs like ours are, you know, through mentors, um, as well as providing us with projects to work on. Our, we're always looking for new projects. Um, and additionally, at the age group that we're working with high school students, you know, internships do matter a lot to them. Um, and it's not just like a concrete internship, like a project they can use. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of our students have come to us and said, um, can we use the, the projects that we're working on as final projects for this class and can we put those on our resumes? Can we use those in our college apps? Um, and these are students that really do want to aim high for the colleges and we've had conversations with them about why they should apply to Harvard. Um, <laughs> but, you know, these are concrete ways that they can actually improve their application and show um, not just colleges but or, uh, companies that they actually have the skills and the, um, the way of using these skills for actual impact. Um, and so working with you know, academics, research groups, um, community organizations, we can really give them those uh, experiences that they can take to the next level. And I, I want to throw out there real quick, sorry Amy. Go ahead. I, f I forgot to mention where you could find our application that I mentioned. You can check out treasuryofwearysouls.com. Thank you. Um, and I want to flip it a little bit on its head. And for the community organizations in the room, um, wanted to point out Mike Shields and give him a chance to talk a little bit about the resources available as a data consultant from Bari. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mike Shields. I am with the Bari team, so I hope you've been having a good day so far. I know I have. <laughs> but I am uh, Bari's data consultant through the generosity of the Miller Foundation. Bari created this position for community organizations and nonprofits. We recognize as well that more and more people are speaking data, and there are groups that are being left behind. So part of Bari's mission to make everyone sort of uh, more data literate is we offer this free service to anyone, individual or organization, who is looking for a way to become more data literate or learn more about how do I make my program or project have more of an impact or learn more about the population I want to serve. So I just want to throw out that resource that we are ready and available to help you at any point. So thank you. One more question from the audience. Everyone's getting tired. There's one. Oh, one more. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this actually kind of builds off of the last question. Um, so I work for a youth entrepreneurship organization, and one of the things that I'm interested in is this balance between skills-based and then also building in like a social, um, for us it's like social entre entrepreneurship and enterprise. For you all, it's more civic oriented. So um, I, I just wanted to know your experience of like, you know, external funding with balancing skills-based and um, like you wanting your students to really pursue what they're interested in and the things that matter to them in their lives 
but also like balancing the curriculum and the framework for that. Um, that's a great question. So we, our, our focus is, is very narrow. Like it's, it started off being like we're, gonna, we're just gonna enable people to build what it is that they wanna build. Um, we decided that we were gonna have the, the singular focus and it's job placement. Um, now that said, whenever we can and however we can, we try to allow for some sort of individual, creative, and typically social expression. Um, my favorite moment in which this happens, at, at least at Resilient Coders, is that the way that we recruit, uh, we don't, so we don't leave and test, we don't test. Uh, and so the way that we recruit is that we have um, one day long events, one day long hackathons, during which people can identify social issues um, that they would work to solve if they had these sort of techno you know, technological superpowers. Um, and so the stuff that comes up on the board, so we do these several times a year uh, in order to recruit for students. And the stuff that comes up on the board is, um, it's, uh, it's really compelling. It's, uh, sometimes it's amazing, sometimes it's disheartening, um, but a lot of stuff comes up and it's an opportunity for, for students to say, look, this is, this is what I care about. Uh, you know, I, if I could, you know, when I can code, I'm gonna do something about the incarceration epidemic, or I'm gonna do something about uh, you know, access to affordable childcare. I'm gonna do something about uh, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and sometimes, not always, but sometimes those come back in the final project that I mentioned earlier. So we had two students work on an application that connects people to, to affordable housing because that was a lived experience. One person who grew up with, a, uh, uh, with mutism uh, wasn't able to communicate as a child, came up with an application that would allow a child to indicate on you know, an iPad what they're feeling and have it alert the teacher. Um, did I hear a whoa over here somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> I, all right, cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, with your whoa. Um, and so we, I guess this is a very long-winded way <laughs> of telling you that we no longer push it at Resilient Coders. Uh, but it, it comes up anyway because we can't bat it down. So to close out, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to throw out one ask, thing you wanna share, what do you want this audience to do, go to a link, have at it. What, what would you like this audience to know about you, your organization or something that you wanted to share today? I think if there's, um one key message, I'd, I'd, I'm buying time here. Um, uh, in all seriousness, I would say that um, as you're thinking about partnering with um, community-based organizations and resident-led organizations and groups, um, uh, approach that situation with a process-based um, a process-based attitude, a relationship-based attitude, as opposed to one that's just purely transactional. Um, all right, so more concrete, that's an awesome, I'll have as deep of a comment as that. Um, but you know, like I mentioned, if you're interested in working with us to expand our program, um, working with you know, generally Boston schools, and we've developed a good set of contacts. Um, if you're interested in your organization, bringing civic tech or generally civic or tech as separate entities um, to schools, to Boston high schools, uh, definitely reach out to myself or Alicia. I'll be up here. I'm happy to share uh, my email or contact information. So definitely do reach out to us. Thank you. Hire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hire, if, if you can, if you can hire engineers, hire resilient coders. Uh, if you cannot hire engineers, um, one other thing, I'm gonna, the one and a half things. Um, I would say that we, we tend to be uh, uh, finger waggers, right? Well, if those people over there were to do something, um, and so that's something that we have encountered a lot while building and developing our own program. Uh, and so I would encourage people in this room who are building and developing their own programs to avoid finger wagging and say, well, if those people over there would just get their stuff together, this would be fine. Um, own it. Um, and I would say that um, to, to not forget that the value of technology is relational and, um, and we have to be more conscious of that and understand that the work that we do is not just about problem, sol problem solving in the moment, but about cultivating long-lasting relationships. 
please join me in thanking our speakers. Thanks.